But what if Jesus did mean what he said? What if he's called the Word made flesh? If the Word made flesh, what if he could say exactly what he meant to say and inspire people through the Holy Spirit to write it down? What if that is a possibility? We've never considered that. Now, we are in a political season, and both political parties, they're both promising wonderful days ahead if you just vote for them. Wonderful progress, making America great again, progressing forward as a nation. I heard, honestly, what they're providing, or what they're promising, and I heard a guy say this once, and it stuck in my sticky brain. Every four years, both political parties promise the kingdom without the king. All the promises they make to us are all kingdom promises with no king. Kingdom conditions. Trump says he'll make America great again. Hillary says she's fighting for you. Uh, number one, there are four dead guys screaming, you don't want Hillary fighting for you. Four men that died in Benghazi because Hillary was fighting for them. And Trump, on the other hand, he'll take whatever grievance you have. I love the guy. He's great to watch. But whatever problem you have, oh, that's terrible. That's horrible. We've got incompetent idiots running these things. Oh, we're going to make it a beautiful, huge, wonderful, great solution to all your problems. It'll be huge. But they're promising, they're, the reason they're making these promises and they're promising these kingdom doctrines is because we know we're not living in the kingdom. We look all around, we see injustice, we see inequality, we see corruption, we see problems. We want peace, we want safety, we want righteous leaders, and we're not getting it. So every four years, they all make their promises, and you know, one's from the left perspective, one's from the right perspective. But they're promising Jesus conditions without Jesus. You know, we can build a wall. That's probably going to solve a good chunk of the problem. It's not going to solve it. Same thing, you know, Hillary wants to keep anybody in the world from getting poor. You know, take a bunch of money from other people, give it to them. It may help. It's not going to solve it. The problems will not be solved until the king is on the earth. But they're promising Jesus conditions to a country that largely doesn't want anything to do with Jesus. How's that going to work out? What's this have to do with what I ta started talking about? But how does that sell? We know the world is inherently evil. So we want the problem solved. Now the left says, oh, well, we just need to continue progressing because we're evolving into better people and a better society. We're all getting better. Well, we started off swinging from trees as monkeys. Now look at us. We can drive cars and write, type on computers. <laughs> That's what they believe. <laughs> I know it's funny, but... You think about the world progressing, and you look at Romans 1, where Paul's talking about the situation all the way back before the flood, and we see what the world was like. Filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, deceit, malignity. Anything change? <laughs> We're still right there. We haven't progressed an inch. So sorry, Hillary. We are... We're pre-programmed to believe the promises of both left and right. Different ways, though. Left, obviously, we're evolving and progressing. But what about the other side? Every four years, we have hoisted on us the Republican Messiah, who's going to fix everything. And they promise you the kingdom. And we're going to make everything righteous. Right? Last time we decided to try a Mormon. That didn't work out. We're just furthering the kingdom like Matthew. We know why these guys think their way. They think their uncle was a monkey. They think... 
Did you know this planet we live on was created through an amazing process of evolution? See, it used to be just this dead space rock flying through space. And then one day, another dead space rock, a comet, smashed into it. And then four billion years later, we have oceans and trillions of life forms. They just popped up out of these two dead pieces of space rock smashing into each other. Isn't that wonderful? I don't have enough faith to believe that. <laughs> I know what happens when I take one dead rock and smash it into another dead rock. I have maybe three or four dead rocks now. <sighs> you got to do something to get rid of God and the Creator, though. But what about the other side? Talked about the kingdom. They want the kingdom, right? Everybody on the right wants the kingdom. They are taught, they buy in to the political Messiah because most of their teaching and preaching that they've ever heard comes from three chapters. Anybody ever hear a message from Matthew 5, Matthew 6, or Matthew 7? All of them. Matthew 5 through 7 is commonly referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. It's got the Beatitudes in it. I call it the Constitution to the Kingdom. The King laying out, this is how things are going to go when my Kingdom comes. That's the way you see it. But everywhere... It's presented as this is what Jesus wants to tell you Christians here in America today. So the, they're constantly in the kingdom. Things should be fixed. Everything should be wonderful here on earth. And everything should be righteous. So here comes some guy promising, hey, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. I'm going to punish the evildoers, like old George W. said. That must be the Lord's man. You got Trump standing up there. Hey, yeah, two Corinthians. That's what you guys are all about, right? Yeah, I'm a two Corinthians guy. <laughs> oh, I love it. But people are largely taught from the Sermon on the Mount. That's their Sunday school message. That's their evening service message. Midweek, we may stray and go a chapter away from the Sermon on the Mount, but pretty much that's where you're at. So here you are. You know that the Sermon on the Mount is the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. What was that about? Oh, he was talking to Israel. But everybody you know thinks it's their doctrine today. So here you come along and maybe you hand them a book that's got a bland title, like Jesus wasn't talking to you. <laughs> you know, something just boring like that. Ah! Don't touch it! might get its heresy on me. They've never heard anything like that, but they know for sure you're wrong. Why? Because they've never heard of it before. And they didn't wake up that morning saying, I'm wrong about so many things. I just need to find somebody to give me the answers. They didn't wake up like that. So, let's put on the table, what if Jesus... What if Jesus meant exactly what he said? And what if, as your friend, your family member, everybody you know thinks, he was talking directly to you and I today? What does that mean to us? Let's test that. We'll put there, give them, for the sake of argument, we'll start with their right. And let's go through some of this stuff. And like I said, the most popular, the most Worn pages in your Bible, if you're in a denomination, will be right around Matthew 5 and 7. So if you've heard 500 messages on it, tonight's 501. Hopefully it might be a little bit different. Matthew 5. So Matthew 5.1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. So just Jesus and his disciples in the mountain, and he opened his mouth and taught them. So he's teaching his disciples real quick. Is that me? Nope. <gasps> what are you talking about? 
We're all disciples. Matthew 5 is not too far away from Matthew 10. And what do we know about Matthew 10? It says, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, right? I know we have, a, I heard we have a, a Native American in the crowd tonight. Anybody here, Israel? 25% doesn't count. <laughs> and it's not even about, anyways, we know we're not Israel. So Jesus says, I'm sent not to, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay. Matthew 10, he says, or I'm sorry, that was Matthew 15. Matthew 10, he says, go only to Israel. I am a Gentile. I am a, a dirty Philistine. That's not me. Now, that's Bible. But every preacher in town will tell you, this is Jesus talking to you. So who's right? The preacher in his Cadillac or the words on the Bible page? Most of the time, unless you need it to not be right for your denomination, right? Yeah. I'm going to go way out on a limb in Romans 3, 4, let God and his words be true, and let the preacher with his Cadillac be a liar. It's taught as doctrine for Christians. There are no Christians in the passages. There's no Christians in Matthew 5 through 7. Am I the only person that noticed this? Hebrews 9, 15 and 16. They're not even New Testament Israel. <laughs> Hebrews 9 says, without the death of the testator, you cannot have the testament be in effect. So not only are they not Christians, they're Old Testament Israel. But it's to the right of that page. You might as well be looking at Nahum or Habakkuk. That'll definitely get me thrown out. You know what else about Matthew 5 through 7? Christ says nothing about his death, burial, and resurrection as payment for anybody's sins. That's kind of a big deal, right? He says nothing about it. So what I want to do, I want to save everybody here a ton of time for the rest of your life. That's what we're about here, efficiency, right? I want to save you a ton of time. Now, I know you've all heard 500 sermons on this, these passages, and you've heard, however long their sermons were, 500 minutes of preacher blather on the subject. So I want to try to save you. I can't do anything about your past, but I can help you from here on, and I want to save you time for the rest of your life from here on out. When next time you turn on your TV or you're listening to the radio or, or whatever, sitting in your church, and you hear a guy read a passage out of Matthew 5, 6, or 7, and say, now brethren, you already know what's coming. But what follows, now brethren, if he starts with what Jesus is trying to tell you here today, that should be like nails on a chalkboard to you from now on. As soon as you hear that, you can go click and save yourself all that time of having to listen to what the preacher tells you Jesus is trying to tell you today. Just you hear it? Click, done, on to the next project. Or if you happen to be sitting in a church service and you can't just click, you could say, okay, earbuds, and do whatever I need to do on my tablet from now on. So I just saved you all kinds of time. What do I know about what Jesus has to say in Matthew 5, 6, and, 6 and 7? Well, if we actually read the passages, look at what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 17. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. How is he saving me time? According to Matthew 5, 17 and 18, you no longer have to listen to the guy in the thousand dollar suit 
blather on and tell you what he thinks Jesus meant to say to you, according to whatever sermon outline he bought that week. According to Matthew 5, 17 and 18, the only thing you need to do to figure out what Jesus is trying to say in Matthew 5 is go back in the law and the prophets and find it. He's saying, everything I'm doing is to fulfill the law and the prophets. So where's my answer? What does this mean? He just gave you the key. Go back in the law and the prophets. Who is that about, by the way? Israel. So why would I make it me when I'm supposed to be the new creature of the mystery body that nobody knew anything about before? Rather than trying to cross-reference and conflate, and what do you call it, the soup or the blender? Rather than try to put Paul in a blender with Habakkuk and Matthew and jumble it all up and pull out the parts I like, leave the parts that I can't handle or don't like, and here you go. You don't have to do that anymore. Just find the cross-references in the Law and the Prophets for what Jesus is saying. And you can fire the guy in the thousand dollar suit. Well, Hooray! Blender eyes. <laughs> so let's go through. This is commonly called the Beatitudes. And it always starts with Blessed are. Let's look at Matthew 5. Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now there's a lot of confusion about this verse. And some folks who have read the instructions where Jesus tells everybody to sell all they have, and they can read in Acts where people are literally selling all that they have, they don't want to sell all they have, so what do we do with the verse? Well, you see, what Jesus is trying to tell you here is poor in spirit, as if you're willing to be poor for Jesus. Are you willing to be poor for Jesus tonight? Would you give it all away for him? Do you love him enough? And on and on. See, I told you I'd save you time, and now I'm blathering like one. What if we can figure out what he's talking about? From the actual verses, can I find something about being poor in the spirit in the law and the prophets? Yes, I can. Everybody remember Psalm 51? I'll give you a hint. It's David, and he's not having a good day. Create in me a clean heart. Take not thy Holy Spirit away from me. Is that a prayer that any of us could ever pray? Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit. No, he promised he's already sealed you with it, Ephesians 4.30. We'd be silly to pray that. David wouldn't, though. Create in me a clean heart, O God, verse 10, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from thee. Verse 16. Now, what's David's problem? He's committed a crime that there's no sacrifice under the law for. You can't, there's no pile of bullocks you can bring to the temple and make go away what David did. So he's just begging for mercy. Yeah. What does he say? For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. So David's begging for mercy. And did he get it? Why? Did you ever think about that? Why would God make an unconditional promise to some king, have him do all the stuff he did, he deserved to die, and then he lets him off the hook? It's bigger than that, though. What do we know about national Israel under their first covenant? Remember Exodus 19? All that he says will do. By the time Jeremiah rolls around, Jeremiah 31, they've broken my covenant. Over and over again, they've broken it. Uh, Ezekiel talks about Israel gone a-whoring. Played the, lover to many, many, uh, played the harlot to many lovers. 
You don't fix that. So what does God offer Israel? The new covenant. You can't sacrifice your way into that. That has to be an offer of mercy from God. And doesn't he say that he's offering Israel the sure mercies of David? So why did God give that to David? He's a perfect type for New Testament Israel. The whole nation getting the sure mercies of David, according to the blood of the Lamb. Getting sidetracked. But that's what national Israel needed. So when Christ is saying, oh, poor in, poor in spirit, it's, a lot, it's not about, I'm willing to give my money to Jesus. <laughs> it's the whole nation. They need to be contrite and broken for, for breaking the covenant. Isaiah 66 um, Isaiah 66 in verse 2, God's talking about the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. In verse 2 he says, The Lord will look to this man, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Now what was going on when Jesus, God in the flesh, was walking around Israel? You had some people who believed him and who trembled at his word. And you had other people who hated him and disregarded him. What happened when John the Baptist showed up? Matthew 3. He say, hey everybody, great news! Jesus is coming, we're all going to have a great day! No, that's not what John the Baptist did. John the Baptist goes out there in his crazy clothes out in the wilderness and says, repent! I'm too proud to repent. I will not. What do I have to be repent of, you crazy wild man in the forest? That's what he's saying. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what does he say about the king that's coming? He's got his fan in his hand, and he's going to gather the good into the, into the garner, and the rest he's going to burn up and destroy. It's a warning. You need to be poor in spirit and respond to it, Israel. You see it? I said turn to Matthew. Maybe I didn't. Look what he says to the proud in spirit when they show up. 3.5, all the people are coming out of Jerusalem being baptized. Then the rich in spirit show up. Many of the Pharisees and Sadducees came to his baptism, and he said unto them, Gentlemen, how good to see you. Matthew 3.5. No, he didn't, he didn't say that. He said, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. So Israel, as a nation, had to recognize we've broken the covenant. We were born of God in Exodus 4. We were God's firstborn son. We need to be born again, as Jesus tells Nick at night in John 3. The nation needed to be born again. They needed to repent. And Christ himself, he, he has a parable in Luke 18 illustrating this. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with this. Remember when the two men went up to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican? And the publican says, I thank God I'm not like this publican over here. And all the publican did, could, he wouldn't even lift up his head. He just said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Poor in spirit. I need help. I've broken the law. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. <laughs> Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican. And then he goes on about his whole self-righteousness. So blessed are the poor in spirit to Christ's audience in the Beatitudes. Blessed are you, Israel, who know you've blown it, who need to repent, who need to be baptized, who need to be born again. That's who the poor in spirit it is. Blessed are they that mourn. How's that working out for everybody you know? Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's not happening very many places on planet Earth today. We'd know that a lot better if we went outside of our country's borders. Blessed are they that mourn, 
What is he talking about, Jesus? Can I find it in the Law and the Prophets? Yes, we can. Zechariah. Zechariah 12. Find the part on your Bible where the gold's really fresh on the side. And then you got Zechariah. Blessed are they that mourn. Zechariah 12. This is Jesus talking to you. Zechariah 12.10. The first thing says, And I will pour upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Hmm. That's not me. The house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The spirit of grace and of supplications. And they will, shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him, as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Blessed are they that mourn. I have a prophecy saying that the people who love love him will look upon him and mourn. What has our nation done to him? Now the priests and the Pharisees, they didn't mourn killing Jesus. They were glad about it, right? When that pesky resurrection thing happened, did they turn around and say, we were wrong, we're believers now? No, they had a conspiracy, paid a bribe to tell lies to hide the resurrection. When the Roman soldiers... Did the Roman soldiers have any reason to lie? That uh, king of yours, the Messiah, whatever, yeah, he, he came back to life. We fell down as dead men. Their angels showed up. It was crazy. Any reason in the world a Roman soldier would ever (laughs) say something like that? But they still didn't believe. They did not mourn. They did not look upon him who they pierced and were sorrowful. But that's exactly how Peter preaches the cross in Acts 2. Peter doesn't stand up and say, Hooray, Jesus is dead and alive again. Let's get ready for Easter. It was the most wonderful thing. He paid for all our sins. Peter didn't know any of that. Peter says in Acts 2, Ye men of Israel, by wicked hands, have crucified the Lord of glory. And he's railing them upside one side and down the other to the point where now maybe they can mourn. And what do they say? Men and brethren, what shall we do? And what's Peter say? Go back to square one. (laughs) Repent and be baptized. The same thing John the Baptist said. So that's essentially what he said. He got him to mourn. What should we do? Go back to being poor in spirit. Start there. Keep going. Um, mourning, and they shall be comforted. Cross reference for that is Isaiah 51 11. Isaiah 51, 11, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. Seems like it's about Israel and Israel's program and Israel getting its kingdom, right? Seems like all the cross-reference we keep running into are about that. Maybe it's not talking to Christians in America in 2016. The redeemed of the Lord shall return, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. I, even I, am that comfort you. Who art thou, and thou shouldest be afraid of a man, and shall die. So, on, 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 on. So, poor in spirit, we've got repent, Israel. They that mourn. king comes back to win. They shall be comforted. What about this one? Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. How many times has that happened in the past 2,000 years? Well, Joseph Stalin really was meek. Tojo was a nice guy. 
Hitler wasn't that bad. He inherited most of the earth at one point. Know any meek people inheriting the earth? So obviously this hasn't happened yet, but this is your doctrine today. First, what do we know about the body of Christ? Is the earth our home? You can't be an ambassador in your home, right? If we're ambassadors, our home has to be heavenly places. Oh, and that's where all our spiritual blessings are. That's where our blessed hope is. That's where we look for the returning of our Savior to take us there. So why would I come to Matthew 5 and say, the meek inherit the earth. That's me. I'm not inheriting the earth. But there is a people that will inherit the earth. God's prophetic people. And that's, uh, I said we got to go back in the Law and the Prophets. Um, that comes from Psalm 37. For yet a little while and the wicked shall not be. Well, I know that's not the case today. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of of peace. So what do I know about that? The wicked's gone. And peace will be abundant. Where is that happening today? Anywhere? Anywhere? When will that happen though? What do we know about our progressive timeline in the Bible? We know that somebody is going to get bound up for a thousand years, right? The wicked are going to be thrown out. And Jesus will be the Prince of Peace here on earth, right? An abundance of peace. So when he's saying the meek will inherit the earth, that's exactly what he's talking about. It's not, why oh, if you just get more... You, you have it in your heart that you want that farm, that big mansion... Why, the Lord will promise it to you if you just be meek. He'll give it to you. Do you believe that promise? You'll inherit that earth that you want. That's the kind of blather that's talked about with these passages. But when we do what Jesus said and go back and look in the Law and the Prophets, we can have Bible expounding on other Bible telling us what Jesus means. That's way better than having a man do it. Um, oops, I skipped too much. Yeah, Isaiah 6, 61 is another one. We go to Isaiah 61 to, to show when Jesus is, is reading in the temple and he stops on a comma. Um, but the other, the other one is we see that he's preaching good tidings to the meek. And what are the good tidings? You read on in Isaiah 61... It's the day of vengeance of our God, and we're throwing out all the enemies of God and bringing in this wonderful time to the meek. What about blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness? They shall be filled. Back to when we started tonight our nation, our country, our world. We just want things to be fair. We just want the rottenness and the corruption to stop and equality and fairness. We hunger and thirst after righteousness, do we not? So you could definitely play that in today's economy. But what about Jesus' own hearers? Right there, Old Testament Israel, on the mountaintop, listening to him, what's he talking about to them? Well, what do we know? We know they were under occupation of the Romans. I'm sure that was totally fair. <laughs> Conquered by a wicked pagan empire. I'm sure everything in their society was going along fairly. Secondly, we know even the rulers of Israel were corrupt. Jesus said in uh, Matthew 23, he said, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Whatever they tell you to observe, do it. But don't do what they do. Whatever they tell you to do, they're sitting in Moses' seat, do it. What does he say about them? They bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders. 
but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So even a lack of righteousness there. But back in the Law and the Prophets, in Isaiah 11, See, when we're done here, you can have these little cross-references in the side here Bible. And what did he mean back then when he said that? Oh, here's my cross-reference. Oh, oh yeah, that's what that's about. So much time I've saved you guys. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Isaiah 11.4 But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. There's the meek again. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. You see why no preachers run the cross-references on this? That's harder to preach on Sunday morning. He's going to slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. When do I know that happens? Once again, the kingdom. Isn't it funny that Jesus is talking about all these kingdom conditions to his kingdom people, the literal kingdom on the earth? And I can find cross-references that go to every one of them. You'd think that Jesus just had his ministry on earth to Israel, going by that. Huh. Exactly. I tell you what, the, you know, I've been at this a while. The more I study these things out and see these things and read these scriptures, the more I'm convinced that this is absolutely the right way to, to study your Bible. Because it's, it's, it just keeps, you know, the snowball just keeps going. And for, for all of you, wherever you're at, if you continue studying the Bible this way, it'll just be dot connected after dot connected after dot connected, on and on and on. What about blessed are the merciful? For they shall obtain mercy. Is that working out for any, everybody you know? Half the time when you try to be merciful to somebody, they stick you in your eye again, right? That's the reality of life with seven billion sinners and enemies of God on planet Earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. What about, did anybody notice that sentence there? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Do we obtain mercy from God based on how merciful we are to others? Is that our situation under grace? By the way, that's the same thing in the next chapter, Matthew 6. If you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. We, are not, we don't have our forgiveness based on, I forgive her for all of her wrongdoings she did to me this week. I do, but... <laughs> I, don't, I have forgiveness for Christ's sake. I have forgiveness on the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ, not on whether I was forgiving or not. Because next week I may not feel like it. Mercy, mercy to the merciful. Can I find that in the Law and the Prophets, Jesus? Psalm 18. Psalm 18, 24. Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness. Oh, mercy to the merciful. According to the cleanness of my hands and his eyesight. With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful. With an upright man thou shalt show thyself upright. That's the exact condition of a covenant relationship with God. You do your part, God will do his part. We have our justification today freely by His grace, Romans 3.24. Nothing to do with any performance on our part. We are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in, not you being merciful or forgiving, the redemption that is in 
Christ Jesus. But yeah, one day, the merciful will obtain mercy. When will that happen? Judging by everything else we've seen here, I'm going to say, go out on a limb and do that. That's the symbol for... Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Whoops. Pure in God. Pure in heart. On one level, you think of John 1, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. On one level, the disciples did see God in that way because they had ears to ear and eyes to see. But what about seeing God on the planet? Don't we know that uh, Israel is looking for Emmanuel, God with us, right? Psalm 24 is where you find a cross-reference. Psalm 24, verse 3. Psalm 24, verse 3. We've only got a few more here. Whoops. It'd help if I was in the right book. Yeah. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Look at verse 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. starting to get repetitive here. When are you going to want to go up the Zion's holy hill and see the everlasting king of glory? The kingdom for those folks that are part of that program. Everyone goes to the earthly, physical, literal reign of Christ on this planet. Now, I was raised in the Baptist tradition. And they know there's a difference between heavenly places and the kingdom. They know that. And they've got all these Bible verses the same as I do in my Bible. So how can you go and preach if you know you're going to heaven and you're not going to the earth? Some Baptists have you going up and down, up and down. But the flavor I was in, you know, you knew you were going to heavenly places. How can you read all this stuff and no, the kingdom references, and Baptists, for the most part, believe in the literal, physical kingdom, as outlined by the Bible. How can you read all this stuff and then turn to your congregation and say, this is Jesus talking to you? That doesn't compute for me. Which is, you know, one of the many reasons I'm not a Baptist. But <laughs> if, you, if you just come to your Bible... I will go where you take me, word of God. That's what I did. I'll come back and study this, see if there's anything to it. I'll go where it takes me. And that, it's taken me to understanding the Bible dispensationally, being Pauline in my doctrine, knowing that's who the doctrine for us was given to, by the same guy who's saying all of this. I didn't pick Paul because I like that part of the Bible better. It's boring. It's doctrine and teaching. And then after that, doctrine and teaching. I didn't pick Paul. Christ did. The same guy who said this to Israel picked Paul and said, you tell Steve about this. You tell Melissa about this. It's not that I just made it up. But blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. 
Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Does anybody ever hear the story of Sergeant York from World War I? The guy that single-handedly killed a ton of Germans and captured like 200 people? Well, he didn't want to fight. He was a conscientious objector. And he, they, he said, you know, I, it's against my religion. I will not go fight. And the draft board said, um, yeah, you're fighting or you can go to jail. So he, this was the verse that got him to decide to fight the Germans. Blessed are the peacemakers. Okay, let's go kill Jerry. He got that from thinking, well, the war is just going to keep going until somebody kills all those Germans. And I want peace and I want to be a peacemaker. So the best thing I can do to be a peacemaker is go kill Germans. So that's, that was all free, but I don't know why that popped into my head. But blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the children of God. Can I find that in the Law and the Prophets? Isaiah 2. Peacemakers. Oh boy, here we go again. Last days, Isaiah 2.2. 2, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and there shall be exalted above the hills, and all the nations shall flow into that. What's that talking about? The kingdom! And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth, oops, the law. But my preacher told me Matthew 5 meant that Jesus was getting rid of the law when he got crucified. Oops. We're pretty far to the right of that in our timeline, aren't we? We've got people going up to Zion's holy mountain. And the word of the Lord in Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And look what they're going to do. Beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Rather, shall they learn war anymore. That verse is inscribed at that wicked, corrupt organization called the United Nations. Any of that happened since the UN started... <laughs> Let's just get rid of all our weapons. Blessed are the peacemakers. Everybody knows Isaiah 9, 6 from your Christmas cards. Unto us a child is born, a son is given, mighty counselor, prince of peace. When's that going to happen? Has the government ever been on Jesus' shoulders one day? Ever? I know people like to tell stories about the founding of our country as if Jesus invented America, uh, but you can read those men's documents. and <laughs> A lot of them did not regard God or his word. He shall be called the Prince of Peace. Of, this, of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform it. So, peacemakers... Beating swords into plowshares, flowing into Zion's holy hill, kingdom. It kind of makes sense, though, if Matthew 5 through 7 is the constitution of the kingdom, as a lot of people have called it. Everybody knows the salt has lost its savor verse, right? The last part of the verse says, have peace with one another. You can't get that in one building of people who like each other. You talk about an axe when you have thousands of people believing in Christ all in one day, and they were all in one accord. And they all sold all their stuff and just shared it wonderfully. And they all got along. You cannot get the people who can fit in a Honda Accord to be of one accord about pretty much anything. But here we have a situation where thousands of people, here's all my stuff, brother. Oh, thanks. Here's all my stuff, brother. Let's share. I mean, we ain't living in that right now. <laughs> that ain't us. Just, I know you know that, but 
Oh, where are we at? Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad about that. Why? That stinks, Lord. <laughs> Hooray, men are reviling me. Why? Not because just that. Your reward is in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You're in good company. Remember all the prophets they killed? You can be named with those guys. Oh. But you have a reward in heaven. Now, time out. This is a verse people will try to take and oppose you who are mid acts and you tell people, no, we're going to heaven. This is about the earth. We go to heaven. They stay here. Nuh-uh, nuh-uh. What about this? What about this? And they'll rub your little nose in it. Ding, 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 ding. You win the door prize this week. They're not wanting to go to their reward. They want their reward to come to them. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, Cross-reference, and we'll finish this up because I've gone long. Sorry. Jeremiah 23, 5 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. Makes you think he's talking about Israel and Judah there. Not sure why. Oh. And uh, they shall dwell safely, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. You see Peter in Acts 5. Let's see they are persecuted. Peter in Acts 5 talks about this. Blessed am I to just have gotten beaten up for Jesus. Acts 5.40, uh, when they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing they were counted worthy to suffer shame in his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. But back to the, the reward coming down. Blessed are you who get to suffer now. I've got a reward coming for you out of heaven. Peter talks about that. He says in 1 Peter 1.3, they have an inheritance incorruptible reserved in heaven for you. It's up there. It's waiting for you. And then to cross-reference that with Revelation 22. Just to tie that button up. Revelation 22, what do we have going on? Christ is coming to earth, right? Riding the white horse. Here I come. He says, behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. So where's the reward? The reward's coming with the Lamb. To give to every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. So, that's a Matthew 5 lesson, hopefully different than every one you've ever heard in your life. But we, who are dispensational, why did I just go through all this? It's not enough for us to say, well, that was them. My preacher told me Matthew was for them. Your preacher stinks. It's not enough to know that was for them. You have to know why. And you have to have some cross-references to be able to sit down with your friend, your loved one. This is where it fits. So that's why we study that. And we know where this stuff belongs. We know the, the people it goes to. But even, even if we didn't have Bible, how many poor people do you see going into kingdoms today? <laughs> poor in spirit. Do you see mourning people get comforted every time? We're all still hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Not getting it. And like I said, the merciful will get stuck in the eye. So not only is this right biblically, and you can cross-refer it, Bible verses with Bible verses, but the bonus is 
it fits with reality. We are in a present evil world. Our days are evil. The God of this world has set up the course and the world's running it. And that's why we can not only have our Bibles right, but we can have reality right. And when somebody comes promising us the kingdom without the king, we can say, that's not going to work out. So that's all I had for tonight. I went longer than normal, sorry. Anybody have anything?